until 12.15 and then we'll break for lunch and I'm gonna fly through some of this stuff. So it's, it's a lot to discuss, but um, I'll, so if I'm rushing, I apologize and we can definitely talk about it more offline. Oh, can you get me? Okay, there we go. Okay, so the goals for today, um, I just wanna give you a broad overview of fMRI just to get you in an, enough of a good place to start actually looking at the data, um, getting you comfortable with some of the relevant terminology that we'll be throwing around, um, and acknowledge that people, as Kendrick mentioned, come from many different backgrounds here. So um, trying to get everyone kind of up to speed about fMRI and what the heck it is. Um, what I won't be doing is going in depth about MR physics or uh, image formation or, you know, how to choose the best uh, parameters for your pulse sequence. Um, it's all very complicated stuff. Um, so MRI uh, is a tool that provides many different types of imaging data. We have anatomical images, so we're looking at the structure of the brain, um, functional images, so looking at, uh, you know, the bold response over time, and diffusion-weighted in images, which are useful for, like, white matter tractography, which are, you'll hear more about later this week. Um, and so structural data, um, which is also referred to as MRI, or anatomical data, we're looking at differences in tissue contrast. So, um, good ways of looking at gray matter and white matter and looking at the structure of the brain. Uh, in contrast, there's functional data, um, which is fMRI. So if I was showing you a video of this, you would see fluctuations in brightness and darkness over time, and that is the bold signal that we're interested in. Both of them are very important and useful, and it's good to collect both. Um, these are a couple of different uh, structural uh, types of data that exist. So there's the T1 and the T2. The differences between them are related to differences in relaxation time constants um, and different pulse sequence parameters. So a shorter TR and shorter TE, so that's repetition time and echo time, leads to a particular tissue contrast where gray matter is gray, white matter is lighter gray. Um, whereas a T2, um, you have a longer TR and a longer TE, and the gray matter is still gray, but the white matter becomes dark. Um, but both can provide useful information about the structure of the brain. Um, and this is useful. Um, anatomical data is useful for surface reconstruction. So we have this volume data that we acquire, um, and we can use FreeSurfer, for example, to segment the brain. So this is looking at the white matter versus gray matter, gray matter segmentation. And this is a reconstructed image of the brain, so it's one hemisphere that we're looking at. And this is the peel surface that you're seeing here. And this is the white matter surface, also reconstructed. Um, and this is showing like the sulci and the gyri, which is uh, useful. And then just here's a, an animation of that. And a nice thing about FreeSurfer is it also comes with atlases and different uh, parcellations, so different uh, brain regions that are connected in some way, some neural anatomical parcellation of the brain. And here's a spinning version of it. What's that? Oh, yes. So, so these are uh, cortical reconstructions, and you can actually take that reconstruction and blow it up like a balloon, and it becomes inflated, so you can see within the sulci and gyri, so this is an inflated version of the brain. Yes? Um, yeah, so the atlas is based on an average brain, um, and you can put uh, your subjects into that common space, so you can get these atlases for each of the subjects. Okay, so um, here's uh, different versions of reconstruction. So we start with this peel reconstruction, and I, as I mentioned, you can blow it up a little bit like a balloon, and then you can see within the crevices of the brain, and you've got this inflated structure. And if you want to go really nuts and it inflated to a basketball, you can do that as well. Um, so this is useful um, for kind of still having a reference point of where the brain the data is coming from, but still getting a full view of what's going on inside the folds. Um, this is useful if you want an even better full view um, with the contingency that you, um, the point being, it's a sphere, it's a sphere, so you have to know where you are on the sphere and how to make sense of what that is in reference to that. Like, is that a visual region? Is that a visual region? So it's a little bit harder to get your reference points 
And then you can also just totally flatten it and get a flat map and also get your functional information uh, laid on top of that, and that can be useful as well. Okay, and then we have the functional data, which is T2 star. It's another relax relaxation time constant. So this is a uh, rapid acquisition, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on um, the details of that just for the sake of time. Okay, so some terminology that you will come across. Um, different viewpoints, basically. So coronal view versus axial view versus sagittal view, and ways that I remember that. Uh, coronal, I think of like a crown, like a headband. Um, so you're getting slices going from your face and working your way back. Um, axial view, um, sorry, kind of morbid, but if you think about like chopping or beheading someone, you, you chop off their neck um, and you slice your way up. So that's the axial view. And then we have the sagittal view, um, that's the Sagittarius symbol, which is like a profile. So think of it as like the profile of the brain. And we have uh, anterior and posterior, that's the front of the brain versus the back of the brain, which can also be, their synonyms with rostral versus caudal. Rostral is front, caudal is back. Um, lateral is further outside edges of the brain, medial is going further inward. And then we have uh, dorsal and ventral. Um, so you can think of like a dorsal fin on a dolphin is higher up on their back. So dorsal up here, ventral down there, which is uh, synonymous with superior and inferior. Okay, so we'll go over a bunch of terminology. I'll kind of cruise through it. Um, so I've mentioned volumes before. Uh, this is basically what you start off with. You've got volumes of data. These are single images of the brain coming in multiple slices and the individual elements are called voxels. And I'll talk a little bit more about voxels in a second. Um, surfaces, we have these cortical reconstructions as you are looking at. So we can look at the peel surface, for example. Um, and so it's a two dimensional manifold, but uh, keep in mind that the actual cortex has some variable thickness to it. Like the primary visual cortex is pretty thin. Um, compared to other areas of the brain. So there, is some, there are some differences in thickness. Um, this is a, the, an image of anatomical scan, and it's showing the uh, cortical segmentation of gray matter versus white matter, so peel versus white matter um, delineations. And this uh, is a cortical reconstruction, and what you're seeing here are the triangles connected to the vertices um, on a uh, reconstructed brain. And then we have uh, co-registration and alignment. So this is when you take one image and try to align it to, a, to another. So as you saw with the NSD data, we had um, the T1 aligned to the T2, the T2 aligned to the uh, functional data. So that is what co-registration is. And this is actually an automated process that Kendrick uh, helped develop um, where it's actually doing this automated alignment. Um, this is a linear alignment of the T2 versus the functional. So it's kind of figuring out reference points and getting these two things into the same spot. And you can kind of eyeball it and make sure that it's doing a good job and you can kind of tweak the parameters if it seems like it's in trouble. So you've got the reference, which is the T2 versus the overlay or versus the functional. Okay, and then we've got these atlases, as I mentioned. Um, Free Surfer has some atlases it comes with, but it's just a way of labeling different parts of the brain. Um, and it's a nice way to get a sense of the organization for individual subjects and um, kind of find common areas like, okay, this is, you know, this is the Heschel's gyrus, this is the primary auditory cortex, this is, you know, so you've got different atlases that tell you different things. And that's related to parcellation, so different distinct partitions of the brain and the atlas is labeling them. And we also have regions of interest. Um, so you'll hear that term a lot. So this is, um, you can define regions of interest in many different ways, uh, functionally or anatomically or some combination of both, but basically it's a region that you're interested in exploring further. Um, and it's a way to kind of summarize your data. So instead of looking at each indiv individual voxel and trying to describe it, you can look at a whole region of voxels and make sense of what's going on in that area of the brain. Uh, so these are hand-drawn regions of interest. I think it's a combination of structural and functional, 
functional information that informed where FFA2, FFA1, and OFA are, which are higher level, higher level visual areas. And resting state. So resting state is basically um, functional data devoid of a task. So you've got subjects laying there, probably fixating, but other than that, they are not instructed to do anything in particular. And it's a way to kind of look at functional connect connectivity in the brain and un understand how the brain functions. This can be useful for medical purposes. A lot of people are interested in uh, resting state data. And related to that is diffusion. So it's another way of looking at connectivity in the brain, but instead of using functional information, you're using structural information. Um, and that is, again, something that you'll see at the end of the week, uh, more details on that. Okay, voxels, um, sorry about that, are 3D pixels. Uh, they're often referred to as volumetric pixels, but it's basically a cube instead of um, a two-dimensional square. So here um, basically is showing an anatomical image and it's being divided into different uh, voxels. And uh, the resolution of your data set is based on the size of your voxel. So as I mentioned, the NSD data set is 1.8 millimeters isotropic, so that is the resolution of our data set. Um, you might come across MNI. It's a pretty common, common, common space uh, that people put their data into. So it's uh, based on volume data of anatomy, um, averaging hundreds of subjects together um, to put them in some sort of common space. So you can put your subject in this MNI space, and then you can report different coordinates of different brain areas, and it suddenly becomes meaningful what these coordinates are. Uh, interpolation, obviously important for pre-processing. Um, so it's, you have these discrete data points, but you want to figure out what the information is that is in between those. So it's a way of filling in or estimating these intermediate values between discrete points that you have. And there's many different ways to do that. Um, head motion, as you've heard a bit about already, head motion is very bad, something to keep in mind. Um, ideally, all subjects would be statues and you wouldn't have to worry about it, and that would make for a very clean data. Um, but they do move, and it really leads to this undesirable noise in your data, um, and it needs to be corrected, either by scolding your subject or pre-processing, or both. Um, and image quality, so this is you look at your image and you see how good it is um, compared to what you're actually sampling. So do you have good signal to noise ratio? Um, does it look like there's a bunch of static? Are there funny, weird streaks in your data? So this, for example, is showing a functional image that's got some ghosting going on there. So you've got some weird aliasing going on. And this is uh, like streaks in your data that can just show up um, related to scanner hardware issues. And then image stability. So how good is the quality of your image over a period of time? How stable is your image? And this is showing a video of a pretty stable image, um, just showing that the subject isn't really moving a lot, and we see that it's pretty stable as far as the, the data that's coming in. OK, and then we've got dropout, which was mentioned earlier. So we've got certain areas of the brain that are more prone to dropout than others, but it's a missing signal um, in your data, basically. So it's due to uh, dephasing, um, due to inhomogeneity of the scanner. So these protons spin uh, more rapidly and dephase more rapidly, which leads to a loss of signal relative to the more homogeneous areas, which have more oxygenated blood. Um, different pulse sequences have different uh, dropouts, so gradient echo EPI will have more dropout um, than spin echo, but spin echo comes with its own issues, so. And distortion, so um, your data can get distorted, meaning your brain is no longer looking brain-like and voxels are being displaced to different areas. Um, so it's something to keep in mind, and it's an important part of pre-processing to do distortion correction so that you can get those voxels back into the place that they belong. Um, 
Oh yeah, so different pulse sequence parameters like switching the phase encode direction can lead to distortion that comes in different forms. So it's important to know that, yeah, distortion is, it doesn't all look the same. It depends on what the pulse sequence parameters are. And then we've got coverage. So for uh, the NSD data set, we have whole brain coverage, but um, if you're not interested in whole brain and you just wanna look at the visual cortex, you can just select a slice that is covering that part and that would be considered partial brain coverage. And resolution, which is spatial or temporal, depending on what you're referring to. So uh, spatial resolution, how large your voxels are, but also temporal res res resolution, like how quickly you're acquiring the data related to your repetition time. And um, some things to consider when you're designing an experiment. Do you want it to be a block design or do you want it to be an event related design? So block design is the idea of doing several successive trials of the same type um, and just looking at the overall response across all of those trials. And a nice thing about that is that you, um, it, it's easier to analyze, it's easier to implement, and it gives you a very robust response and you can look at these nice robust uh, differences in response amplitudes from one condition to another. Um, there's also event-related design. So this is instead of doing a whole block of the same trial type, you're doing um, different events or different trials and you're kind of intermingling the different conditions together. Um, so a single pre presentation would be a single event, maybe of a few seconds. And a nice thing about this is um, it's good for looking at behavioral data, it's look at, good for looking at, um, you know, if you've got some sort of neural adaptation going on, um, you can explore these things when you're doing event-related design. Um, but it does generate a weaker signal than you would get with a block design. And so NSD does do the event-related design. Remember, it's three seconds on, one second off. So that these are pretty rapid events. Okay, so then we can start talking about activity over time, and this is something referred to as a time series. So we're looking at the relative brightness or darkness of a voxel as it's changing over time. So this is the bold response changing over time. And the brightness is related to how oxygenated the blood is. So um, when you're doing a task, uh, your brain, these neurons, you're recruiting more oxygen into the area that is um, used for this task basically. So less, deoxygen less deoxygenated blood means a brighter signal. Um, more deoxygenated blood means that these spins go out of phase more quickly and you get a darker signal. And then, so this, I keep mentioning the bold signal. It stands for blood oxygenation level dependence. So that's the signal that we are measuring. And this is an example of the bold response over time. And this is an example of a time series and what it might look like for a voxel. So you can see it fluctuating up and down. Okay, so here's some standard pre-processing steps. Um, we've mentioned head motion is an issue. So it's very important to do motion correction on your data. And this is an example of a subject that you can see is moving quite a bit throughout the session. So this is motion that is bad, this corrupts your data, you want to correct for this. And this is correcting for that motion. So you can see uh, original versus resliced versus reference. So the original data is the stuff that hasn't been corrected. Um, and the reference is what you want to compare to to get yourself in the right space. And then the resliced is the end result. So resliced versus reference, you can see there's very little difference between them. Okay, and then distortion correction, as we mentioned, uh, the data, the brain no longer looks like a brain. It can get misshapen due to various things. So uh, you want to correct for that distortion and that's where field maps come in. Um, so this is showing how uh, distortion can affect your data. 
Um, it can be very uh, drastic differences in what the brain should look like versus what it does look like. Uh, slice time correction. So you've got all these slices that you're acquiring over time, um, but you want to treat it as though all of the slices were acquired at the same time, so you do slice time correction. And spatial and temporal filtering. Um, so if you want to smooth your data, for example. And uh, registration, which you saw some examples of. So you want to register the anatomy um, to the functional data, or you want to register you know, one session of a subject to the next session. Um, time series denoising approaches. Do you want to implement ICA as a way of trying to denoise your data? There's a lot of different approaches one can take for denoising. Um, and fMRI can be very noisy and there's many sources to this noise. So we'll just cover uh, some examples. Uh, subject motion, as we've mentioned many times. Uh, thermal noise. So if uh, you know things are starting to heat up while you're scanning, this can add some noise and you can get this kind of low frequency drift in your data and related uh, low frequency drifts. Um, so you've got some low fluctuations in your data, low frequency that you're not interested in. You can do things like high pass filter your data so you're only interested in the high, high frequencies that's actually related to your task. Um, Subject mental compliance, making sure that your subject is awake and actually doing the task is super useful. Um, and cognitive, cognitive and behavioral uh, variability across trials. So cognitive, maybe the participant is thinking about other random stuff. Um, maybe they're not you know, focusing on the task. This can vary from session to se session. And cardiac and respiratory fluctuations. So maybe for some reason their heart is racing more than usual or they're breathing faster or something. These things can also lead to fluctuations in the, the data. And neural adaptation, you're giving them repeated presentations of something, maybe they're adapting. And uh, imaging artifacts, uh, differences in distortion over time, like for the NSD data we did, um, we got, um, oh man, field maps multiple times throughout the session because um, things can change and you want to make sure that you're distortion correcting correctly for the surrounding runs. And it, it can also, you can also get noise from just you doing a bad job of modeling the data. So that's another thing to consider. Okay. So we know that uh, when we give people a, a task, this can um, lead to a variety of different neural dynamics, a lot of stuff going on in the brain. Um, and our assumption is that this neural activity is linear, linearly related to this bold response that we are measuring. So we get this activity and we convolve it with what is called the hemodynamic response function. And that is basically our way of modeling what's going on with the data. Um, so we have all these events. So you can see if people could stay in the scanner forever, um, we could just have one event and wait like 40 seconds, have another event, wait 40 seconds, and then we have this really clean hemodynamic response. But as it is, scanner time is expensive and subjects are human, um, so we need to speed things up. So we get this kind of summation of several different um, bold responses, and we get this different pattern. So for example, with the block design, we're doing a lot of events that are in close succession and it's very evenly spaced. So this is what the bold response will look like, but we can also space out the events or kind of jitter the timing of the events and this will affect the signal. And so, yeah, this is related. So sluggish, sluggishness of the hemodynamic response and the fact that it takes tens of seconds um, for getting a full hemodynamic response uh, makes it a little bit trickier to analyze the data. So, um, yes? Um, as far as I know, it's a pretty good estimate. If it's not linear, it might be near linear. But I think it's, I think it's pretty good. Kendrick, do you have any thoughts? Regime you're in, like the previous 
center is the most important spot and of course it's not in the complete data set you are in the media region. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a long question. I mean, it's, it's definitely not linear, but the question is how bad is it? Uh, NSD was designed to essentially ignore it because you want trials. And so you hope that these effects add up. That, that would be my short answer. All right, so you'll hear the term general, general linear model a lot when you're doing fMRI. Um, so it's just a way of applying linear regression to your data. Um, so we'll go over briefly what this means. So you've got these events, so your different events of your trial, of your conditions, um, and you want to convolve that with this hemodynamic response function, so you're making an assumption about the shape, and then you combine those and you get this predicted bold signal. Um, so down here, um, the bold time series, so this is your data that you have, uh, and you want to try to model that as best you can. So you've got your design matrix, you've got your regressors of interest. So example, you have three different conditions, for example, and the different times that these conditions are presented. So you would predict that the response would look something like that for this condition, like this for the next condition, and this for the third condition. <clears throat> and you also can include nuisance regressors. So I mentioned the low frequency drift over time can be included as a regressor. So things that you're not interested in, but are important to include in your model, um, differences of X, Y, and Z movements in the scanner. Um, so you've got the shape set, um, but then you also want to assign an amplitude to it. So for example, if you think that, um, this condition, you're gonna get a stronger amplitude response than for this one, uh, that can be reflected in your beta weight. So you assign uh, larger weights to that condition. And then there's always gonna be things that you can't or don't include in your model, and the rest of that can be considered the error term. Okay, and this is to kind of put that whole thing more simply. So Y would be the data, that's your time series, and then you've got or a design matrix, which is X. Okay, so here's your time series down there. Um, this is your design matrix. So it's what I was showing in the previous slide, but a different way of visualizing it. And then you've got your beta weights. So these bars can be uh, reflective of the different weights of the betas. So you multiply these together, then you add your error term, and that is basically the equation that you're dealing with. So Y equals XW plus N. Okay, so there's different ways to deal with uh, estimating the time course of your response. So there's the idea of detection. So you're assuming a canonical shape of your response, this hemodynamic response function, and you are detecting activations. That's the easier approach. But some people also like to try to estimate um, this shape. And so you can try to estimate this response for each of the voxels independently, which is what is done with NSD. And it's a more advanced approach, um, not as common, um, but it can be useful depending on what you're interested in doing. Yes? For each subject, but also for each voxel. Okay, so there's different approaches to how you wanna perform these estimations. You can do something called a finite impulse response model, but you can also try other basis functions as well. Um, and these are GLM, just uh, specific types of GLM. Okay, that was easy. <laughs> um, before I do a summary, does anyone have any additional questions? Anything you want me to? elaborate on. I know that was a lot to go over and I went kind of fast because I was afraid I would go over time. Yes? Oh, okay. Yeah, so you're trying to estimate the noise, essentially. You, you have some assumptions about um, what noise you think is in your data, and so you're trying to model that and inc include that and see if that gives you a better um, 
if that more closely relates to the time series that you actually have. Oh. Um, I think you're asking like, where do you get them from? Probably, is that what your real question? Yeah, we could spend a long time talking about this. Uh, I can tell you what people typically do uh, in case you want to know. So conventionally people throw in motion parameters. I'm sure you've heard of this. Uh, Emily mentioned it briefly. So you, you estimate uh, displacement of the head in the motion correction process and it gives you parameters like translation parameters, rotation. And it's very typical to see people like throw them in, into the model. Also typical is derivatives and expansions of those motion parameters. Um, another thing people like to do is if you have physiological monitoring like pulse and uh, heart rate and respiratory, uh, how that's reflected in bulge runs is complicated, but essentially you expand out the cardiac time series that you record with, with like a oxygen uh, reflectance device on your finger, and then you expand it out into like sines and cosines, and then hope that those expanded regressors can be then thrown into the model in an attempt to model out some of the uh, fluctuations, which you don't want. Um, Low frequency terms, like as the last column here, are common. So constant term, linear term, quadratic terms. Some people do uh, cosine basis functions, which are like low frequency, so like half, half of a cycle, one full cycle, one and a half cycles. So these are different uh, mathematical functions that model low frequency stuff. So there's all sorts of things people do. Yeah, so normalization can occur in many guises. Uh, so let's take it one by one. So some people, again, I'll report what you may see out there. Certainly the raw images coming off the scanner, fMRI is not quantitative and what people mean by that is like the number. T typically it's like a 12-bit integer, so it's 500, but it's arbitrary because you can essentially scale the whole data set and it is equivalent. In other words, there's no physical interpretation. And that's okay because what we're interested in is the relative changes with the experiment. And typically those are expressed in terms of percentages. So if your signal's at 100 and you go up by 10 units, that's a 10% bold response. Um, so one way to normalize units is to express the response <coughs> relative to the mean, which is what I typically do. So you, for a given voxel, you just divide the delta by the S. So delta S over S is percentage. So that's very typical. But you know, other people do some like global data set wise normalization. So like maybe Z score all the voxels. So essentially you're throwing away uh, the structural information. So if you look at a functional image, you can see a brain, which means that some voxels are bright, some voxels are dark. But if you Z score all the voxels, everything, the mean is zero. But see, so you may encounter this, so that's very aggressive. Uh, less aggressive would be like take an entire run and take it the next run and ensure that they have the same mean. So that's kind of the run-wise scaling. Uh, people often do that across session. So many things can change on a different scanning session. The head position relative to the coil, the setting on the scanner regarding scaling of the raw voltage of data, like all these. So another thing you may encounter is like, let's set the entire mean of an entire session to a known number, like a thousand. So all sorts of things go on and they, they all can cause issues if you don't, if you're not careful. But I think what you were getting at was normalization of these regressors, which I'm sure you know, in a regression sense, it doesn't matter. If you scale a regressor by A, the beta weight will go down by one over A. So in some sense, in terms of the fit you get, it doesn't really matter if you don't, if you do or do not scale each individual regressor. But certainly the interpretation of the weights you estimate need to know about what was the scaling of the regressor that you used when you fit the GLM model. Um, to, to ease interpretation, what I do is, um, and it's pretty typical, so if you have an HRF that you assume, you scale it to peak at one. And if you do that, the beta weight you estimate will be, can be interpreted as the delta S, like what is the maximum pixel intensity that that voxel reaches. So it's convenient to scale the regressor uh, 
or it's convenient to prepare the regressor to have an amplitude of one because then the interpretation is trivial versus z-scoring. If you use z-score, then you have to worry about, well, how many events did I have and what, you know, so. Um, for the nuisance regressors, maybe the scaling doesn't matter because you're just going to ignore them anyway, so you might as well z-score each of them. So it, it kind of depends on how you approach uh, this. And again, different people do different things, so you have to be very careful. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Other questions? We do have theoretically 10 minutes. So definitely let's use this for discussion time. We had hoped to kind of stop the lectures half, like at different checkpoints to force questions, but we didn't do that, but now we have time. So uh, yeah, Karthik. So how did you estimate the subject specific subject at the box compared to the Good question. Um, I will give you the short version, but I can give you the long version because I'm not sure everyone cares. So the short version is, if I can find that figure, but I'll just, I can give you the, it was the figure that Emily had to skip over. Um, where is it? Ah, this guy. So um, I'll tell you about the figure in a second, but let me lead you to this figure. So as you know, I'm sure you know, estimating HRFs is good in theory, hard in practice, because the data are friggin' noisy, right? If you go, especially per voxel, you try to estimate the HRF and you get this ugly looking thing that you know is corrupted by noise. And in fact, you could quantify the noise if you did something like split half and you'll just see in two splits of the data is not stable. So it looks horrible. So there's a challenge here. Um, the better your data, the more likely you will get good, say voxel specific hemodynamic response functions. So at, uh, People, as you know, sometimes dedicate separate data for this. So let's acquire five minutes of data just to estimate the HRF. So for NSD, uh, I did something kind of different and new. So I, we didn't acquire any extra data. I took all the uh, data from an entire session. So it's significant amounts of data, 60 minutes worth. Um, what I did, oh, it's complicated. So I did use a FIR model. So there was some GLM analysis prior to the final version that you get for the single trial stuff. So you do an FIR type model to try to estimate time courses for every single voxel, but those are certainly noisy. And so what I did then is to take all the subjects and essentially dump all their voxels in one gigantic pot and then to do PCA. I mean, and this, this probably makes a lot of sense. I mean, each individual time course is noisy, but there's a presumption that it's across thousands of voxels, there's some shared common HRF, essentially. And so you dump all these time courses into a big pot, you do PCA and essentially derive uh, the common low dimensional variation of these uh, time courses. So that is this first plot, actually. So this, I'd be happy to give you the longer version, but essentially we're looking at a histogram of HRFs. And this is actually PCA, uh, a low dimensional visualization. So it's a three dimensional PCA space. And I can show you reasons to believe that you only need three dimensions. But now we have a histogram and essentially the, the HRFs actually behave very simply. There's essentially a line according to which the HRFs vary. And in fact, they vary just like that, which you kind of see the resolution's a little low. Essentially they are either fast and skinny or slow and fat. So that's the variation that we empirically find. And so the strategy then is to manually to figure out that manifold, which is just these dots. And then after all of that, we essentially have a library of 20 HRFs. So if you believe that this can be accurately summarized in terms of 20 discrete time courses that you can see on the right here, then we're off to the races because then HRF estimation is trivial. All I did was I fit the data set 20 times and I chose for every voxel the fit that had the highest variance explained. That's it. Which is actually ridiculously dumb, but actually it makes a lot of sense. One advantage is it constrains your HRFs. So you will never get a crazy looking noisy time course because all of these are actually fairly sensible looking. So you're regularizing this estimation really well 
by forcing the HRFs to essentially live on this manifold. So I'm not sampling points that live all the way out here. And, that, and there's a good reason to because there's almost no voxels that look like that. I mean, noise, of course, will show up. You might get a few handful of voxels that are off, in the, off uh, this histogram, but almost all the voxels kind of span this uh, simple manifold. Yeah, that's a very good question. I don't know. Um, what I do know is I looked, I can show you offline the eight different subjects and I can show you flip, 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 flip. And they, some subjects have really fast HRF, some subjects are slow, but they all kind of live on this little manifold. So I think subject variability is, to the extent that our eight subjects are representative, is not a big deal. But certainly diff different paradigms, like if you have a long multi-stage working memory paradigm, then of course the dynamics are going to be quite complicated. Right. Right, but then, I mean, if you, presumably you're gonna model the stages of the cognitive task using a underlying HRF, and then this could be that. So if you plug these in into a traditional, you know, stage-wise model, then maybe that would be an, a good way to go. That took longer than I hoped, but hopefully that made some sense to some people. Do you have like a ballpark of how how does it relate to a canonical HRF? And oh yeah, one thing we noticed is, and people that have seen this, um, to what extent does this matter? Or can we just assume a canonical thing? But your mileage may vary. It depends on the experiment. If you have a block design, it's not gonna matter that much. If you have a very rapid event related design, it will matter. You probably have an intuition for that because the dynamics in the block design are really slow. So even seconds differences in this HRF will not really amount to much when you're when your expected time course is a very fat trapezoid that extends for like 20 seconds. But NSD had a very rapid design. Um, anyway, I can show you a figure, but basically uh, we, I compared, I think this was what you were getting at. I, I fit the data initially with a canonical one just because it was easy. And then I started doing these, this crazy HRF estimation. And I can show you evidence that actually makes a big difference in terms of quality of the beta weights. It, it was shockingly large. It was actually larger than GLM denoise ridge regression stuff. <laughs> so if you're gonna spend time and energy on something, <laughs> I would say number one, head motion, and then maybe number two, this HRF stuff. So, um, very good question, and I'd be happy to give you a lecture on that. <laughs> um, in another life, I study veins and high-res stuff. Um, so my working at model is, they do vary quite drastically, but probably because the vasculature varies potentially rapidly. So, you know, small veins versus big veins, it's complicated, but um, if you move like a millimeter or two over, you may, suddenly be on a vein or not. And that's a fairly rapid uh, spatial change. And veins tend to have delayed and fatter time courses, essentially. So, and I can show you a figure actually of, in the depth files that are prepared for NSD, one of the files is the index of the chosen HRF, one through 20. And so your student project is go look at those files and see how smoothly uh, varying those indices are. Um, so it, it, yeah, uh, and I imagine it does rapidly change at a, at a fine scale. Oh, any other questions? We still have two minutes. Yeah. Yeah, so that theoretically will be talked about tomorrow. Um, getting more at analysis as opposed to data quality and pre-processing. So we can table that for tomorrow. <laughs>
Okay, good. So we're convening here.